These are my conflicts of interest, which are not really relevant for the present talk. And so I think we have to start uh, with one question, which is what are we really measuring with positron emission tomography? As the title of my talk somehow suggests that PET is measuring uh, inflammation, which is exactly not the case. We are measuring something that is uh, that approximates inflammation. So just a few words on the very basic uh, principles of, the, of a PET, which uh, most of you are probably familiar with. We are basically injecting in the patients uh, the oxyglucose labeled with uh, a radioactive isotope. And so this is, enters the cell and is then trapped after phosphorylation into the cells. It is the oxyglucose, so it cannot go anymore towards the Krebs cycles. And so really what we are imaging that with the emission of a positron from this molecule is the rate of metabolic activity of the cells, how much glucose the cells are picking up, how much the cells are metabolically active. And of course, for this reason, PET is widely used for the study of cancer, which heavily depends on um, anaerobic glucose metabolism. But inflammatory cells, and particularly neutrophils, are also avid uptakers of FDG. And in this study that we've done with, the, I'm sorry, the reference is down here, with Dr. Mush and published on anesthesiology at the time of my fellowship in Boston, we did a unilateral model of ventilator-induced lung injury. And you can see uh, it was a very uh, tough model for the animals uh, carried on in the right lung. And you can see how the right lung is picking up glucose, is uh, showing up brightly. Why is that? Because it is full with neutrophils and all the neutrophils are picking up FDG. And if we induce a neutrophil depletion, what we see is that the FDG signal is going almost to zero. Uh, uh, corresponding to a decrease of the circulating blood cells. This is another uh, study from our own group, Dr. Zambelli, uh, and we've also induced a unilateral lung injury by uh, acid installation in mice. So this is micro PET. Here you see the injury on the micro CT and you see the FDG signal in the injured lung. Now it's interesting to see how the uptake of FDG is correlated with the number of neutrophils and macrophages present in the ex vivo microscopy of these animals. And in fact, in recent years, more and more data are showing that not only neutrophils could be responsible for FDG uptake, but uh, these are data again from the Boston group, but that depending on the type of injury that the lung underwent to, there can be a significant uptake also from endothelial type two cells macrophages and neutrophils. But still, neutrophils are responsible for the largest amount of the signal that we see. And so these were the premises for our study, the rationale for our study. The fact that uh, FDG PET can be used to assess metabolic activity in the cells and that in the, in the setting of lung inflammation, these metabolic activity can usually be ascribed to inflammatory cells. And we know that there is a major uh, role of neutrophils in the onset, in the generation of ARDS and in the perpetuation of the disease and of ventilator-induced lung injury. So on we went with uh, this study, which began with some, I would say, simple uh, goals, which were to uh, establish the metabolic activity of the lungs, or if you will, the inflammation of the lungs in patients with IRDS, and to describe the distribution in the space in correlation with the corresponding CT scans. Uh, this is the study population that we enrolled 
17 patients overall, and you'll see that we actually did two studies, so not all patients are included in both. Uh, 17 patients with what we would now call just the RDS, at the time there was still ALI RDS. Uh, they were not exactly in the early phase of the disease, so the mean was nine days of intubation, but the, the, the uh, standard deviation was very large, uh, quite hypoxic, and the PEEP was, I would say, in a rather high uh, ballpark uh, figure because it was 12 with uh, safe, uh, consider a safe plateau pressure on average and uh, tidal, protective tidal ventilation. This is the imaging protocol we use and once again I have to thank all my colleagues who really were supportive through this tough study. Uh, we brought the patients who had an indication already, a clinical indication for a CT, and this is, was required by our IRB, not just to have a CT scan, but in adjunct, they would also have a dynamic PET. So we uh, did the CT scan, injected the bolus of radioactive glucose, and did an image of PET. And from this image with some uh, Mathematical models I will not get into, we derive this parameter Ki, which is basically a number that tells you how much glucose is being picked up at the whole lung level or at a given region of interest that you want to look at. So Ki is really the rate of FDG uptake, which once again, if you will, can be used as a proxy for inflammation. These were the results of our first study published in 2009, Critical Care Medicine. And we did show that all patients with their DS had a diffuse uh, inflammatory activity. And uh, this is the KI of uh, the normally aerated tissue of our subjects. And you see how, on average, this is much, much higher than the controls, with an about seven-fold increase uh, as compared to controls. And this was in the tissue that on CT scan looked as normally aerated. So on the so-called baby lung, it did look normal on CT scan, but it was not normal at all. It had seven times the metabolic activity of the uh, healthy controls. And another thing that we've seen is that while in some patients we got some this kind of pattern that we would expect it, that I would have expected before beginning the study, so that the areas in which most of the collapse was going on <coughs> had the greater inflammations. In other patients, the pattern was reversed, it was the other way around, and we had areas which were somehow aerated but that would pick up more FDG than these regions dorsal collapsed that had no ventilation at all. So this was kind of an observational uh, study. Uh, and our findings were <coughs> somehow confirmed recently by this paper uh, published in Critical Care Medicine by uh, Joba Borges working in Uppsala with uh, Professor Joran Eliestierna, who has shown that in a model of VILI, of ventilator-induced lung injury, the greatest uh, difference between uh, controls and injured animals occurs in the normally aerated and poorly aerated uh, lung. So this somehow confirms that the normally aerated tissue once again looks normal on CT scan based on density criteria, but there is inflammation going on there. There is a battle going on there that we don't see just looking at, at uh, uh, densities. So the, the second part of our study was to assess what could be the relationship between the regional deformation induced by tidal ventilation and uh, metabolic activity or, once again, inflammation, if you will. And <coughs> I know this is a little bit schematic, but uh, for the purpose of our study, we let's say, uh, divided the, the potential mechanism of, we identified the two main mechanisms of ventilator-induced lung injury. One being cyclic opening and closing of alveoli, or so-called atelectroma, and the other one being over-distension or distension of lung, which is already ventilated. And once again, I know this is a bit schematic, but <coughs> I think it's, it's, for our framework, it was quite a useful distinction. 
So in this, uh, uh, the results of this study were published in this paper, 2011, on the Blue Journal, where we had to put in the title, not inflammation, but regional metabolic activity, as the reviewers would not allow us to, to write inflammation. But I think the paper would have looked much more fancy if we could have written inflammation. But anyway, that's, that's how uh, the things went. And you live, you learn. So we added two CT scans at the end of the study, one done at PEEP and one done at uh, plateau pressure, <coughs> that would allow us to establish the deformation of the lung induced by tidal ventilation. And so if we look at the first mechanism to identify the regions of the lung that were uh, being cyclic opening, opened and closed, sorry, we identified some regions of interest. The first one being this blue lung, which is collapsed both at end expiration and end inspiration. And here we could compute the inflammation of this region, which is always collapsed. And here in red is the lung that is collapsed at end expiration, but then gets irated at the end of inspiration. And this was, there was a first uh, automated segmentation, but then we manually reviewed each CT uh, slice to avoid that this was somehow due to a movement of the structure, that it was a real opening and closing. And so also for these regions, we would compute the KI of the regions undergoing cyclic opening and closing. And with our, I would say, uh, big surprise, we found no difference. So the, the KI of the regions that are recruited throughout the respiratory cycle is not different from that of the regions who undergo cyclic opening and closing. And this does not mean at all, this does not mean at all that atelectrauma is not injuring the alveoli. There's a ton of evidence that shows that if you uh, open and close cyclically an alveolus, it, this would induce injury. Uh, what we found, however, was that in our clinical setting with the, with the uh, ventilatory strategy that we did apply, the amount of this tissue was just a little bit of the total weight of the lung. It was no more than 3%. So what these data show is that probably in our setting, we haven't seen a signal because the amount of lung op being opened and closed was relatively small. The second uh, mechanism we uh, we focused on was the uh, distension of the lung, which was already ventilated. And uh, we focused mostly on the normally aerated lung, and we found a statistically significant correlation that, I mean, it's not a huge number of patients, but this is a kind of a physiological study. We found a statistically significant correlation between the inflammation of the normally aerated tissue and plateau pressure. And there was a steep increase of the inflammation above 26, 27 centimeters of water. And now, of course, this is a bit of uh, the egg and the chicken question, because we couldn't think if this is just an association that worst patients have a higher inflammation and higher plateau pressure, or if there is any kind of cause-effect relationship so that the higher plateau pressure is somehow causing a higher uh, inflammation of the normally aerated tissue. And we cannot give a definitive answer to, to this question, of course. The, the only way we could think of approaching this issue was we've measured the KI, the inflammation of the tissue which is not aerated, which is not exposed to tidal ventilation. And this, if you would allow me, is a kind of a baseline inflammation for the lung. And then we took the KI of the normally aerated tissue, which is exposed to ventilation. And so the ratio between these two might, might 
allow us to dissect a little bit more the effect of ventilation because this KI would see both the RDS process and the ventilation while this KI is more likely to see only the RDS process. And to make a long story short, we found that the correlation was still there and it was even more significant. So plateau pressure is associated to a higher inflammation of the normally aerated tissue, potentially having a, a causative role in this. But once again, I would be very cautious in stating that. When we looked at tidal volume, we've seen no association between tidal volume in terms of predicted body weight and uh, KI. And once again, this does not mean at all that tidal volume, high tidal volume is not causing lung injury. We know that very well. The problem, I mean, not the problem, the situation here is that these patients were being treated. And so what happened is that likely severe patients got a reduction in tidal volume. And so we, we, we would not state that tidal volume is not causing lung injury. But there are more and more data coming out at the literature, more or less in the same time. Our colleagues in Milan, Alessandro Potti, were doing these studies where they show that what they call strain, which is the ratio of tidal volume over FRC, is a major determinant of lung injury, of ventilator-induced lung injury. So they randomized piglets to different tidal volumes, and they measure this ratio. So what is the ratio of tidal volume to the space that the tidal volume can occupy in the lung. And as soon as this strain went up, there was a huge formation of edema and a change in lung weight. And so more or less at the same time, we did the same thing. And we measured the tidal volume that is distending the normally aerated tissue in comparison with its uh, relaxation volume. So we have a given end expiratory lung volume, and this gets an inflation. So this ratio is somehow similar to the strain. It's not exactly the same, but it's quite similar. And in this case, we found that this instead was really associated with KI itself or KI normalized by the uh, KI of the ventilated tissue normalized by the KI of the not ventilated tissue. So suggesting that the, the, the ratio of tidal volume to end expiratory lung volume, which once again is not exactly strained, but is close to what is being called strain, is highly associated with lung inflammation. And uh, lately, uh, more one year later, this paper by the group of, of Alba Iseta came out. And they've shown basically the same thing with a very different approach, which is that if the strain is slightly high, is above, uh, strain defined the way we did. So tidal volume over end expiratory lung volume is above 0.27, and the numbers are in the same ballpark like the ones we found, there was a much higher um, um, circulating inflammatory activities than if the strain was lower than 0.27. So getting to my conclusion, I think that uh, PET data show uh, give a direct evidence of the fact that in humans, in human patients with ARDS, the baby lung is in fact inflamed. We haven't been able to see any evidence in our patients of injury caused by, by atelic trauma, but once again, this does not mean that atelic trauma would not cause acute lung injury. Uh, that the inflammation of the tissue, which is being ventilated, is associated both to a higher uh, uh, to plateau pressure, particularly if above 27 centimeters of water, and with the ratio of tidal volume to end expiratory lung volume. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention.